three, two, one. Oh, do I got a special guest today. One of the most inspiring sports celebrities of all time and the only pro golfer to win the Grand Slam on the PGA and Champions Tour. And what I believe is the athlete that brought fitness to golf. One of the best to ever tee it up, Mr. Gary Player. Welcome to the show, Gary. Hello, Corey. Nice to talk to you, my friend. Thanks for that nice introduction. Oh, man. it's uh, So I worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the past. He was one of my idols. And I got to tell you, from a fitness and just a professional standpoint, you were the other one, Gary. So to have you on the show is extremely meaningful, and, and I couldn't be more excited to have you. You know, Corey, um, I don't think people really realize to the extent that I do what a great country the United States of America is. When you've traveled like I have, which is more miles than any human being that's ever lived now, 70 years of travel, I appreciate every single day I'm here when I think about it and what it's done for people around the world athletes, people coming from all over the world to be educated at, uh, you know, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't have a vocabulary like a Winston Churchill, unfortunately, to explain my gratitude for the United States of America. And when I came here, I had uh, so much love and I had so much success, which I was very grateful for. I had one dream that I wanted to do, and that was to help the youth of America uh, Winston Churchill said, the youth of a nation are the trustees of posterity. And so my dream is when I see at universities today that, you know, 85, 90% of young people smoke, they either drink or they on some kind of weed or other, which to me is so sad when you think you've got to build a country on these kind of people in the future. So my dream was to contribute to this country in response to what I had received from it. And my great dream was to influence people. You know, it's it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than to get people to exercise every single day, watch their diet. Uh, it's very, very difficult. But being 85 now and still pushing 350 pounds with my legs, increasing, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sit-ups and run on the treadmill flat out, so can still sprint very hard. Uh, I thought if I can keep doing this, and I've been on the Golf Channel and shows like yours, and I'm really almost like a preacher on fitness. Yes. Uh, it's the most cherished thing you have. It's so interesting that so many people would be so interested in the stock market and this and that and this and that, and yet they don't worry about the most important thing in their lives, which is health. Now, my wife right now has pancreatic cancer, which is a terrible thing. She's 83. She always stayed fit. She was a wonderful golfer. But these kind of things can happen. But you've got to exercise every day. And Corey, I read a wonderful uh, proverb hmm. from a lady in uh, Tibet. She said, to live well and to live long, you've got to eat half the amount you do. Now, can you imagine telling an American or a South African that he's got to eat or she's got to eat half of what they eat because we all eat like it's the last supper. Yes. Secondly, she said, you've got to do twice as much exercise as you do now. Now that could be related to many things. A lot of people might walk uh, half a mile. They're going to walk a mile. So there's a lot to be thought about that. And thirdly, which I love because I do my life spending this, you've got to laugh three times as much. And I laugh all day long. I tease my 22 grandchildren and my family and my friends. And fourthly, you've got to have unmeasured love in your heart. And if, if, you get applied, if you apply that to your life, you've got a great chance of living a long time. But I tell you, people can't do it. They can't do it. They, they just can't do it. I don't know what it is. I'm around people as strong as a lion but they've got a big tummy and my family say, don't, you know, don't be so critical of people. I said, I love people so much. I have unmeasured love in my heart. And I know what happens if you don't look after your body, you're going to suffer like a junkyard dog one day. Yeah. People take overweight, care of their car. Overweight Gary. stops a train, Corey. Yeah. Weight right. stops people, a train. People take better care of their car than they do their body. It's unbelievable. It really is. And, uh, 
it's just a tra it's such a thrill for me to be 85 now, almost 85 in a month or two. And I still play golf and I shoot many rounds of 69, 70. I've broken my age over 2,700 times. So, you know, I'm just, uh, I've always got a goal of some kind. I'm in the gym and I want to increase it as I get older. <laughs> Eventually age catches up with you, but so far it's not catching up with me. I don't know if you saw me do a somersault at the swimming pool the other day. And a hundred meter in a hundred meter dash too. And a hundred meter dash and pushing 350 pounds with my legs. I'm trying to show the young people, look after yourself, be proud of your country, do something, do something for your country. Don't go to school and, and be concerned about socialism. Socialism, I tell you, and I think that, that places I've been to and I've seen socialism, Corey, these people lose their freedom. They lose their dignity. It's just a tragedy what I've seen. I went to, the, to Berlin after the Berlin Wall was knocked down. If you saw what socialism did to that country, you'd be astounded. I can name so many countries Look at a country like Iran. They just shot 12 or 13, I read, they shot 12 or 1,300 uh, students when they were demonstrating. If you look at the things that apply in these countries, freedom, freedom is the greatest gift bestowed upon a human being. Yes. I came to America, you know, in 1957. Yeah, I, I and I met, you. I was, can you hear me? Yeah, I want to ask you about your dad real quick, Gary. So. Yeah. One thing that we share is uh, a family of miners. So I'm a fourth generation coal miner. I mm -hmm. actually worked as a coal miner for six months to save my money to start my first fitness studio. And I know your dad was a gold miner. So I'd love to hear some of the stuff that you learned from that type of work ethic growing up. My father worked in a gold mine, 8,000 feet under the ground. Never made more than 100 pounds a month in his life. He had three children, had to educate them, and he played golf. And he was, he had to leave school uh, at what we call standard four. Standard four, that's, uh, that's probably uh, five years of schooling mm -hmm. because he had a large family and his parents died. So the only place he could get a job was a gold mine. So at 15 years of age in those days, you could get a job in a gold mine. And he was a big man, six foot two. You'd never think how he produced such a small runt as me. But he was six He was six foot two. He was always laughing. They called him Laughing Harry. He played golf. Uh, he encouraged me to play golf. He spoke three black languages fluently. And he spoke Dutch and English. So, you know, there are a lot of highly educated derelicts walking the street for jobs today. It takes more than just education to survive in this world. Wow. But he, he, he really... He, he, the first time I needed a set of golf clubs, I didn't realize he had an overdraft in the bank to buy me those clubs. And he taught me a great thing about being punctual. Of course, golf teaches you to be punctual. If you're not on the tee at the right time, you, you're disqualified. Yep. And my dad said, my first banking episode, I said, he said, I'll meet you at the bank at 11. I got there at five past 11. He wasn't there. So I phoned him. Those days you put a penny in the phone to phone <laughs> And I said, where are you? He says, what's the time? And I told him, he says, I was there at 11. I didn't, he didn't wait for me. And that was a great lesson. So, you know, one of the great things in life is to honor your mother and your father. Yes. When you think what your mother and your father do for you in life, it's incredible. And it's amazing. I'd say that 30% of young people do not own, I'm taking a guess. Yeah, it's a large number of children don't honor their mother and their father. I didn't care what my father did. I just loved him. And I, lo I adored my mother, which I was unlucky to lose at the age of nine years of age. And wow. then my brother went to war. You know, my brother went to war at 17 to fight for the Americans and the British. And my brother-in-law, future brother-in-law got killed. And mm -hmm. this is where I started the fitness. My brother, prior to going to overseas to the war, he stood there, he said, you're very small in stature. What do you want to do? I said, I want to be a professional sportsman of some kind. He said, you're not strong enough. And he bought me a, a set of secondhand weights. Okay. What year and is I this, trained, Gary? And he said, promise me you'll exercise for the rest of your life, which I've adhered to. I mean, and I'll do that until the day I die. That's at the moment, at least 63, 64 years that I've been exercising. 
Wow. So what year was that when he introduced you to that in the 40s? Uh, well, he went to war in about 19, must have been, I was, yes, I was born in 1935. So okay. this was about 1943. Wow. wow. So a long and, time and ago, huh? Did he have did he have some traditional things that he showed you early or did you just kind of learn on the go? What was kind of the I guess how did you learn the basics of weightlifting? Did you do clean and jerk and snatch, which a lot of European countries did, or how did you kind of start the process? I, I did, you know, I had to work it out for myself what uh, was good for sport, what would give me speed, what would give me strength. I did a lot of deadlifts to make my back strong, and I did a lot of stuff for my core. And I want to just show you this on your screen. Can you see the way? Yeah. <laughs> that is like a plank, man. And the thing is that uh, I love I it. did all kinds of exercises. And then when I started to play golf, eventually I did golfing exercises which would help my golf for a long time. And when you judge athletes in sport or anybody in the sport, you've got to say longevity. Yeah. Long, put longevity in your judgment of athletes. Yeah, amazing. So, but can I just be interrupted um, a minute? Sorry, and just tell you that my brother, yeah. when he came back from war, obviously they devastated. It does something to your mind. Yep. He eventually became the leading conservationist in the world. Wow! And I'm playing golf at a lot of different golf courses here, and honestly, it just slays me. They are cutting their trees down. Trees that are eighty and ninety years old. They're cutting these trees down. Those people should be fine. The municipalities should be on these people. We've got to yeah. plant more trees, not cut them. Everybody's yeah. saying it makes the course in better condition. Hogwash. All the golf courses I've played, and I've played more golf courses than any man alive now. Some of the best golf courses I've played are tree-lined, and so there's just a fad that architects and golf equipment, uh, not excuse me, and golf committees are doing. And most of them are city slickers. They don't realize the value of a tree to the extent that they should. Is there a reason, uh, because of the nature, why you stayed in South a South Africa all these years and traveled all these crazy amount of miles? Which is, with from a fitness standpoint, extremely hard because when you travel on a plane to that level, it's hard to then get up, get get off a plane, be dehydrated, make sure you work out, stay up with your food. Um, was it just the the South African nature that you could never get away from, Gary? You just loved it so much. Uh, South Africa is really. It's like America. It's a mini America. It's, it's been a beautiful country. I think politics have done it an enormous amount of harm all around, all around from when it started, well, well, from, from 19 in the 40s to now. Um, we've been riddled with bad things in politics. Um, but South Africa, it was my home country. I love the people. I love the black people because my father spoke three uh, different languages. I just it had a climate that was just unbelievable. The best beaches in the world, the best game reserves with wild animals. You've never lived until you've been to a game reserve in South Africa. Yes. And honestly, it's just been an incredible, beautiful golf courses, hundreds and hundreds of golf courses that, that stand up to any other golf courses in the world. And it had a fascinating beat about it. I don't know, just hard to explain. A great diversity of people, 11 languages. So <clears throat> wow. you take our schools, our high schools, are the highest educated high schools in the world. Kids speak five languages now. It's unbelievable to see um, what's taking place. But now we, you know, there's like right now, the ANC, our black government, fought for their freedom and, and they got it. And now they making quite a mess of things, unfortunately. Just as our white government who had the apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, which I lived under, uh, they made a mess of things. So, but I'd, I'd just like to tell you something about a man, Charlie Siffer, that I met. It just goes to show you if a person's given a chance in life. When I arrived here in 1957, I went to LA, I played in the LA Open and I met a black golfer called Charlie Siffer. And I met him and they tell me what a good player he was. And I said, Mr. Sifford, why are you not playing? He says, I'm not allowed to play. I'm not allowed to. So when I came here, you had an apartheid system. And he said, I'm not allowed to play. So I went to the PGA and I did what I could. And I went up to his course in Cleveland. And eventually he got to play. And when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, he asked a white South African to induct him, Gary Player. 
that was some special honor. Amazing. Wow. And so Lee Elder, the... here's another thing. Lee Elder, the black golfer, I invited him to South Africa because I played golf with my president, uh, who was a staunch believer in apartheid. I don't play with a man because of his political views. Mm -hmm. But anyway, luckily I played with him because I asked him, I said, I want to bring a black golfer to South Africa to put a spoke in the wheel of apartheid. And he looked at me, I thought he was going to say, get out of my office. And he said, go ahead. He liked me. And he said, go ahead. And Lee Elder, the black golfer, came down. I was called a traitor. And he was put under great difficulty by the black community well, uh, in America here. He came down. It was a great success. It was our PGA. And it was just such a great success. So it's a wonderful thing to know in your life that you've tried to put a value on the word freedom. If yes. you look at all your soldiers that died in Normandy and the people that died and fought for freedom and people today just want to throw it out the window. It's just, to me, it's barbaric. So I was raised by a World War II vet. Uh, my, my grandfather taught me how to lift weights and how to play golf. And he just passed away last week at 93 years old. He was big, strong, worked out all the way through. He was 85. We played our last round of golf at 88. And it's something I did my entire life with him. He's pretty much like my dad. And he, you know, he, he signed up for the war when he was 17 years old and went to World War II. It was just, uh, just a great generation of amazing people that helped build this country that had a sense of patriotism, patriotism that was just unmatched. It, it was truly, truly unbelievable. Yeah. Um, good, tell me about Nelson you. Mandela. I think for good, some of yeah. my younger audience, they would love to hear some things that you learned from that great man. Well, first of all, I'd like to compliment you on your father because they, he helped to keep the freedom in this country. Yes, and freedom is actually diminishing at the moment. But to come back to Nelson Mandela, he was one of my five heroes. Uh, when he got out of prison, he asked to meet me. Well, I mean, what an honor, and which I was just so excited. And I went to see him. And I was sitting there, and I said to him, I said, he was Mr. Mandela there, not president. I said, you must hate the white man and have great revenge in his heart. He says, to the contrary. He says, I love everybody. I love even the people that put me in jail. Can you imagine this? This man was so full of love, so full of forgiveness. And he said, I've got to now help build a strong economy, get people who are pouring out of South Africa to come back and live here. And he said, uh, you see that uh, apple on the table? It's green and juicy inside. I can't be looking good on the outside and rotten on the inside. I've got to be good on the inside and I've got to bring people together. And he said two things, which funny enough, uh, great leaders like Nelson Mandela, uh, Martin Luther King said, you got to love kills hate. Yep. He says, love kills hate. And you know, Mahatma Gandhi said the same thing. Mahatma Gandhi, this great Indian, was standing there outside his house and a man came by and he said, the guy was a Muslim. And he said, are you a Muslim? Are you a Hindu? Are you a Buddhist? Are you, what are you? He said, I'm a Muslim. He said, I'm a Hindu. I'm a Buddha. I'm a Jew. I'm a black and I'm a white. And can you believe it? They assassinated him. And they assassinated Martin Luther King. And they assass assassinated Kennedy and his brother. People that fought for freedom. And young people must never forget this. Yeah. These people died and fought for freedom. My goodness me, if you live in America, you should go on your hands and knees every day. Now, they do have faults. America does have faults. But does there, is there anybody that doesn't have a fault? Is there yeah. any country that doesn't have a fault? And we will rectify it. But yeah. the thing is, go on your hands and knees that you live in this great country. And when I see that American flag, and my brother came back and he said, I was so proud of that flag. He said, you know, a flag is not a black man. It's not a white man. It's not a Democrat. It's not a Republican. He says a flag is a symbol of freedom. And if yeah. you don't like freedom, if you don't like freedom, go somewhere else. Yeah, agreed. Gary, if you, if you think about the average golfer that's going to watch this, that isn't a scratch golfer, but plays a couple times a week, what's a couple exercises that you would say is a must that you have to do on a regular basis or a certain amount of stretching? Like what's a daily routine that either you keep 
or you would recommend to the golfer that, you know, wants to shave off a few strokes. And it's really because of whether it's turn, flexibility, strength, power, or whatnot. What, what's a few uh, tips that you have? <laughs> well, there are a lot of things you mentioned there. They're not going to do it. <laughs> I, I, no, no, I'm aware, but we still got to tell them, right? That's our duty. <laughs> I mean, you've got a gym. How many people, I always say to a guy, he says, I've signed up for a gym. I said, well, in a year's time, you'll be out of that gym. You won't be in the gym. He says, yes, I will. You know what happened. But oh, anyway, yeah. if there was one single exercise people have got to do, and that's their core. They've yep. got to have a strong core because you see, I'll show you on your screen. When you start, the most important move in the golf swing is from there. See that? Yep. Rotation. Rotation of the hip. As you come into the ball, you've got to rotate your hip. And that's what is the most essential ingredient in the swing. So, mm -hmm. and then also if they can, you know, if the average person could just walk a couple of miles a day, just walk. Uh, you know, do anything. But people sit in that chair and they become old and they fade away like the sun sets every day. <laughs> the body at rest stays at rest. The body in motion stays in motion. I mean, that's but, that's that's, yeah. the, that's the basic. Uh, but the big thing is, Corey, we mustn't forget. Uh, I often debate with people and I often I study this. I say, what's more important, what you eat or how you exercise? And what do you think? What do you think is more important, how you eat or what you exercise? I think you can never out-train a, a terrible diet, but I think like anything else in life, it's moderation. I think there has to be a relationship between the two. So for my, myself, Monday through Friday, I try to be really good. On the weekends, I like to have a pint of Guinness. I like yes. to enjoy family time and, and enjoy a few things. But if I think about it, it's really 90% of the time I'm eating so I can have the abs that you see and, and feel healthy and be able to play. Like I'll be 42 years old. Uh, I'll be 42 in three weeks. And my goal is to dunk a basketball by my 42nd birthday. And then I'll work on another goal. And I, I've had continual goals for 20 years, every three months. It's a bodybuilding show. It's a powerlifting meet. It's a cover of a magazine. It's some type of athletic. And for 20 years, I've followed this pattern of continuing to push myself. And I had a goal to, to reach a certain handicap so I could play St. Andrews two years ago. I shot 90 yeah. at St. Andrews yeah. from the mid tees. That was a goal for me from a golf standpoint. Like, you know, and it's one of those things where you, I just continue to push and it just continues to work. And what I loved about things that you wrote in your book, Don't Choke, is that you just always had something there. You always had action. You always went one extra step. And what people don't realize is the luck comes with the action. The luck comes with the mindset there is, you produce it and people wonder like there, like there's some dust that, that got sprinkled on why these things continue to work. And that's why, like when I, as I've read your book multiple times, I was like, he's saying it, people aren't listening, but I still feel like we have a duty to continue to tell them because it just takes one light bulb every now and again, Gary, to, to come on to where people go, wait a second. All right, you know what? Maybe let me let me go ahead and try a new daily routine where I add this exercise. Let me try a new daily routine where I listen to this audio. So one of the things that I do is I lunge 400 to 800 meters after I lift weights almost every day. So that's that's my conditioning workout. So I so I'll lunge about 100 miles in a year uh, mm -hmm. for my leg conditioning. So whenever my you know any sport that I play everything um, is usually strong and the connective tissue is strong. And so I'm always out here preaching new things, whether it's pro golfers, NFL or weekend warriors, that the activity of the mind and the body daily. So I get up at three in the morning. I'm at the gym by 4 a.m. We work out from four to six every morning. And that right there sets the tone for the success of the rest of the day. And I know you're huge on daily routine. So I'd love to hear some of the things that you do each day that has just been a part of your success. I run on the treadmill at flat out. I uh, also, I exercise my entire body because as you get older, you lose your balance. Okay. And so really the core and the legs are the most important thing to have strong toes. That sounds crazy. Uh, you can have exercises for your toes, your calves and your thighs and your core. That's the essential thing you've got to do because, you know, people forget how quickly life goes by. It seems like yesterday I was winning all those major championships and the time just zooms by. But you've got to think, you've always got to look into the future. You've got to be a person that has vision and look, look after your legs 
and look after your stomach. But I, I think, uh, I agree with you about the food and the exercise, but there's certain foods that you, I don't eat. Personally, I don't eat. I don't touch bacon. I, I did this with the other, a young person that I said, take a piece of bacon at night and put it in some hot water and look at it tomorrow morning and see what it looks like. And you put that in your body. This is only what I do. I'm not telling everybody what they should do. I yeah. don't want to eat white bread. I don't want to have a glass of milk. Uh, these are just what I've done for me to make sure that I don't. And I try not. I have I've, I took an oath to God never to have an ice cream again 24 years ago or a piece of bacon. And I've wow. stuck to that. So you've got to make sacrifices in life. Life. You've got to make sacrifices. Life is not a, you know, life is full of adversity. The greatest gift bestowed upon a human being is adversity. And people who get adversity are inclined to become depressed. And, uh, and so the big thing is you've got to realize it's a gift because when you have adversity and you fight it and you beat it, you're successful. Now, you don't have to make a lot of money in life to be successful. There are many ways of being successful, not just being rich. Sure. So I think what you eat and sugar. Now, that's my weakness. You know, sometimes I'll have a snicker and a weekend. I won't even take the paper off. I mean... <laughs> So the thing is that uh, really I, I think the way you eat is terribly important. I think to have a beer occasionally is good for you. I'm yeah. reading a book now on health. It says a, a beer a day is actually good for you. It yeah. says a cup of coffee, things that I never thought were good for you. A cup of coffee every day is good for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading about all the berries and the, the fruits. And, you know, there's so many great avocados, all the green vegetables, spinach, you know, broccoli. Uh, cauliflower, you've got, to, you've got to eat all these things. But most kids, they're deprived of it. They're, unfortunately, their parents don't know what to feed them. And, you know, you, I'm in the racehorse business. I'm telling you, that's the greatest athlete in the world. Yes. If you don't train it and you don't feed it properly, it becomes a donkey. <laughs> that's a great... <laughs> that might be my favorite thing so far. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that I think the people, when you say you have to eat these certain things, they feel like something's being taken from them. When the reality is, when the discipline is inserted into their life, the freedom actually opens way up. So the reason why you had success is because you were so disciplined in your daily routine, in your training, in your methodology, which allowed you the opportunity to get on those stages and then to step up when it was game time to win the major championships. And a lot of people don't realize that all they think about is, Oh, I'm not going to not eat pizza. Oh, I'm not going to, but it's like, if you add some discipline in your life, it allows you then the opportunity to go live some of your dreams because you have to be sharp. Like when I got in the room to have a business meeting with Arnold Schwarzenegger to be my business partner, my confidence, how sharp I was, the way that I felt, the way that I looked, Though all these years I had worked, I'm sitting in front of the man that was my idol with a chance to be his business partner. And I thought to myself, if I came in here 30 pounds overweight, my energy, my insulin's all dove out from eating terrible. Like I'm not going to deliver at that level where I need to, to make a whole difference in my career for the rest of my life. No, I was on my game at a hundred percent. I was eating good. I was training good. I was about my business. I was up every day at three in the morning. I'm at the gym by four. Like that allowed me the chance when I was in the arena to then deliver with exactly. then to stand by my idol and work with them. Like people don't realize that sacrifice. Like for instance, during that meeting, Gary, I was on the cover of fitness RX with my kids, which is right here. And it was one Great. of the first times it had ever been done. And one of the investors bought it at the airport and threw it to Mr. Schwarzenegger in the meeting. And so this is one of the guys, like the discipline of who we're bringing to you to work with you for, for this business. And it's like, I remember how hard that was to get ready for that. And if I wouldn't have had that level of discipline, I would have never had that opportunity. And so I think people got it backwards for some reason. They don't want to sacrifice. I don't know if they can't see it. Pat, they can't see past the trees, but that's one of the thing is like the doubt creeps in. And maybe the goals aren't set right. And that's where I'm trying to do with my content is, is wake people up, you know, put some discipline in your life and then dream a little bit and then go get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you see, unfortunately, in this great country, there's a great sense of entitlement. Yes. And ent nobody's entitled to a damn thing. No. That's the thing. And, you know, parents, 
I'm not putting, uh, when my dad said to me, you got to go to bed, I went to bed. And I see the young children today because I've got 22 grandchildren. Yeah. You tell them to go to bed, they don't necessarily go. Yeah. And you've got to instill the discipline as well as the love, lots of love, but also discipline. And you've got to make sacrifices, as you said. You've got to make sac sacrifices to be successful. But who wants to today make sacrifices? Because I went to do a golf clinic the other day for some youngsters, and I said, asked them a question. I said, just say yes or no. Do you have three meals a day? Yes. Actually, quite honestly, I think we don't need three meals a day. I think the most we should have is two meals a day. But anyway, he said, now, then I said, do you have TV? Do you have air conditioning? Do you have blankets? Do you have a nice bed? Do you have a mom and dad? Do you have a nice school? Do you have a car? I went on all these things and they all said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, damn it. Most children in the world don't have one of those. They yeah. might have a TV and they probably stole it. Yeah. But they certainly didn't have the money to buy it. Yeah. So you don't know, again, I'll come back. You don't know how lucky you are when you live in this great country. Yeah. May God keep it going strong. That's all I pray. Yeah, I agree. Talk because nations... That. Because nations are throughout history, you know, you can take all the great nations of the world. They all lost it. You look at the British Empire, you look at the Roman Empire and America, this great empire. It's going to take the youth with the right attitude and the work of work, family, faith, 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 hard work, you know, love these things. You're going to have to instill in them and they're not. Unfortunately, it's not being instilled to the extent that it should do for this great, great, great country. So I think part of the problem is, Gary, is everybody wants it right now. Can you right. talk about patience, understanding that you went through this process as a undersized compared to Arnold and, and Jack, and you had to train and you had to do the extra workouts after you get home from a late night, uh, knocking on the door so you can get the hotel key to get into the gym. Like, Talk about the patience of – you know, understanding if you dedicate to the process that you could believe that all those things that you achieve were possible. You have to have a passion and you have to be hungry. Even though you've got food in your stomach, hungry doesn't mean only food. It means uh, a lot of things in life. I was hungry to be the best. And, you know, I look back and I used to say with Arnold and Jack, who are my dear friends, we traveled the world together promoting golf. And I said, come on, do some exercise. And they were both so strong. They never did. Yeah. Arnold Palmer at my age couldn't break 95 on a really good golf course. Jack Nicklaus today can't break 80. He struggles to break 80. And he's overweight, and I beg him all the time to exercise to the extent that he should. They never did. Yeah. And so their longevity has not lasted. And so it's been a good example for me to tell young people to really exaggerate the situation. I don't know if you can, but anyway, it's a... Uh, I used to go to that, uh, have a dinner and I'd come back and it was my night to do exercises. And they said, the gym is closed. And I went to the manager. I said, please give me the key. I promise you I'll bring it back and to the front desk. And I exercised at night. Now, I'm going to tell you, this sums it all up. Winston Churchill, my all-time hero. You remember September 11, what a dreadful thing it was. Yep. He had that almost weekly, weekly with the Germans bombing London, et cetera, et cetera. But Winston Churchill was one of the greatest orators besides Shakespeare that ever lived. He now listen to this carefully. You should put this on your wall. The height that great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. It just didn't happen. But while his opponents were sleeping, he was toiling upward in the night. That explains it all, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> and Boy, education, and education for these young people. Go to school. Don't worry about all these things that are happening around the world. Get the best education you can and do something. Make sure say, I'm going to thrive to do something great for this country. I've got another interview in four minutes, so I can answer one more question. So lastly, I give away a Rolex on this website every year for a transformation. People that lose 30 pounds, 50 pounds, up to 100 pounds. Tell me about your Rolex. I know it has a lot of history to it. I've got a presidential myself, which I'm really proud of. I'd love to hear that, and we'll wrap it after that. There's my Rolex right there. Now, for a poor boy who had nothing to wear, a Rolex is a great dream, I can tell you. Agreed. And I've had an <coughs> excuse me. I've had an association with Rolex. Hmm. 
<coughs> since about 1965. Wow. They are the most incredible company. When you think what they do for sports and sponsors, I don't know of any company in the world that sponsors to the extent that Rolex do. They are a marvelous company and they look after their staff. I went to Geneva. Arnold Jack and I went there with Jackie Stewart and uh, also the great skier. I can't quite remember his name at the moment. Uh, but anyway, uh, we went there and we visited the entire company. And the way they looked after their, their employees was so important. And, you know, Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore was one of the greatest leaders the world ever seen. He said, incentivization. People have got to be incentivized to do well. And it's so true. And this is what Rolex do. I cannot tell you what a company they are. And I cannot begin to tell you the things that they do around the world. It's amazing. Mr. Player, thank you for your time. This was a dream come true. <laughs> What a pleasure, and God bless you, Corey, and God bless America. Thank you, sir. Have a Bye -bye. great day. Bye.